The Cuomo political dynasty is on life support tonight, and the Democratic Party delivered the critical blow. Good evening, I'm Leland Vitter. It's hard to understate the unprecedented nature of what happened today. A year ago, he was hailed as America's governor and a possible replacement on the Democratic ticket. At the very least, here, he, Andrew Cuomo, was the undisputed hero of the Democratic Party. Today, 11 brave women did what countless political rivals could not, bring the Cuomo political machine to its knees. From the Big Apple to Pennsylvania Avenue, a political firestorm rained down on Governor Cuomo. We're going to try and condense the drama of the last 12 hours in politics into the next two minutes. Here it goes, starting this morning in New York City. The investigation found that Governor Andrew Cuomo sexually harassed current and former New York State employees by engaging in unwelcome and non-consensual touching and making numerous offensive comments of a suggestive and sexual nature that created a hostile work environment. These were not isolated incidents. They were part of a pattern. The governor's pattern of sexually harassing behavior was not limited to members of his own staff, but extended to other state employees, including a state trooper who served on his protective detail. One current employee who we identify as executive assistant number one endured repeated physical violations. Executive assistant number one had vowed that she was gonna take these violations, as she put it, to the grave. She was terrified that if she spoke out, she would lose her job. The report speaks for itself, and at this point, the chip, um, we're going to allow the chips to fall where they may. I never touched anyone inappropriately or made inappropriate sexual advances. I welcome the opportunity for a full and fair review before a judge and a jury, because this just did not happen. As we have said before, the reported actions of the governor were profoundly disturbing, inappropriate, and completely unacceptable. No elected official is above the law. The people of New York deserve better leadership in the governor's office. We continue to believe that the governor should resign. Back in March, you said that if the investigation confirmed the allegations against Governor Cuomo, then he should resign. So will you now call on him to resign, given the investigator said the 11 women were credible? I stand by that statement. Are you now calling on him to resign? Yes. And if he doesn't resign, do you believe he should be impeached and removed from office? Let's take one thing at a time here. I think he should resign. A big night calls for big guests. Former prosecutor Robert Schalk on whether Cuomo will face criminal charges. Justin Miller covers the Cuomos and will take us through the destruction of America's last great Democratic political dynasty. But first, we want to start with Axios congressional reporter Elena Treen on how this changes the national political landscape. Uh, you heard it right there. The who's who of Democratic politics saying resign. Is there any Democrats still supporting Andrew Cuomo? Not that we've seen, Leland. And I mean, this is really all of the Democratic elite. You have President Biden, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, all of them calling for his resignation. And so he really is left without allies in his party in Washington right now. Um, and I think it's really telling that all of them are calling to resign. But also, mm -hmm. I think, you know, just having watched that last clip back, one key thing that they're not doing is going so far as to saying that they would support impeachment proceedings. Uh, I personally tried to ask uh, Chuck Schumer this today, and uh, he just continued to reiterate that he stands by his statement that he thinks he should resign, but didn't go any further than that. Yeah, Justin's going to get into the impeachment debate, because that's uh, raging full steam ahead in uh, Albany right now, also in New York City. Uh, you've done so much great reporting on the divide between progressives and the old guard, middle of the road Democrats. Does this exacerbate that or help heal that? It's a really good question. Um, you know, it's interesting because 
And I, I was thinking about this today. I recently interviewed Katie Hill uh, for our, our HBO show on Axios, and um, she went through something very different. She said, looking at at what Governor Cuomo was going through and people like Congressman Matt Gates, to see that they're standing by, they're denying these allegations, mm -hmm. and they're not choosing to resign is very different from what she went through and what uh, Senator Al Franken went through before. And it really was a different time in the height of the Me Too movement, where we saw Democrats come together and and push Al Franken out. And now we're seeing, um, you know, particularly before, less so now, but this divide between what they were saying and, um, you know, with regard to the allegations against the governor. But I think that what's happened today and, and after this report and just the damning findings that the attorney general found, um, everyone in the Democratic Party are now yeah. kind of coalescing together with the same message, which is that he should resign. And so I think to answer your question, they're actually really united on this issue right now. They're united, but how much of that is because of political expediency? And then how much of that is because somebody like AOC now perhaps sees uh, a political opening. If all of a sudden Kirsten Gillibrand becomes the governor, there's a Senate seat open. She doesn't have to primary Chuck Schumer, right? It, it's a good point. I, I don't. I don't know if, if someone like AOC right now is, is trying to map out, you know, how how this might affect her if the governor's. You know, if the governor has a vacancy, um, which you know a lot of people are already saying that they want to run for governor in 2022 against him, um, but I do think the politics of this is very important, and it does, you know, particularly when it comes to issues of sexual harassment and these types of allegations. Uh, it's it's very clear where progressive stands, and they always stand yeah. with the victims. Democrats in general do, but particularly progressives and the younger people yeah, some um, of those... who call for these these more drastic changes. Yeah, some some of those sound. The sound bites of Governor Cuomo standing with, say, Brett Kavanaugh's accusers have not uh, aged well. We have some of those coming up a little later. You mentioned Al Franken, and there was a lot of discussion back during the beginnings of the Me Too movement, or the height of it, I should say, uh, that people resigned too quickly. Are there any Democrats you're talking to who mm -hmm. privately are sort of saying, gee, we learned our lesson with Al Franken. Maybe it'd be good if Cuomo stuck around for a little while? Not that I'm hearing. Wow. I think that... I think the difference between before this independent report and now is just so abundantly clear yeah. to people in the party that no one is willing to defend him, even privately, um, against what has happened. And and I think it does really pose the question, you now that especially that you have leadership as high up as the president calling for his resignation, how tenable is him remaining in his position? And also, I mean, I think a key thing to remember is he's still running. He has not announced that he does not plan to run for reelection. 2022. And so the question now, I, I personally think, is really timing. How long does he hang on and can he hang on? He's showing that he wants to. He's denied. He's kind of using, to be honest, the Donald Trump playbook and, and you know, trying to just deny and hope that people forget. I don't think that's going to work, though, well, in this situation. It worked so far for Ralph Northam, who's still governor of Virginia. So we'll see how long you can hold on. It's true. Elena, great to see you. Great reporting, as always, at Axios. We appreciate it. Thank you. Good to see you. Thank you, Leland. All right. Local look now. We bring in Justin Miller, the news director for the New York Magazine's Intelligentsia that has broken numerous exclusives through the Cuomo scandals. We'll zoom in now, Justin. Uh, you heard Elena say there's no Democrats in Washington uh, supporting Cuomo. Are there any Democrats in New York that he's getting support from? No, the few remaining people that were waiting to see which way the investigation would go, what the results of the investigation would go, um, including Eric Adams, the uh, Democratic nominee for mayor in the city have now decided, come out in light of the investigation, said hmm. the governor has to go. Yeah. You know, Cuomo, the Cuomo's ran New York City for as long as I have been alive, ran New York State, I should say, with an iron fist for as long as I have been alive, depending uh, how many years you think that is, depends on how much gray hair you can see on my head right now. Uh, how did they lose control in just a year? It's very simple. Um, the governor intimidated an assemblyman named Ron Kim. Ron Kim decided to speak up and said, I'm not afraid of you anymore. Then a woman by the name of Lindsay Boylan, who worked in Cuomo's office, said that she was inspired by Ron Kim speaking out. She published her own account of sexual harassment by the governor. And from there, dominoes continued to fall. And even as early as March, the governor was under severe danger and said, you know what, I want to stanch the bleeding here. 
Attorney General Letitia James, why don't you investigate these allegations? Now she's returned a report that is more than 168 pages, damning in its detail and shocking. Um, I think shocking anybody who saw this story. It, it's shocking in its detail and in sort of how conclusive it is. Typically, reports leave out more things. This was pretty uh, Sherman-esque, shall we say. Uh, sticking on this theme of New York politics, though, because it's, it's fascinating and what happens in New York so affects uh, the rest of the country. We've seen Chuck Schumer become quite uh, progressive, at least in his willingness uh, to talk about it, his votes uh, depending. A lot of people think that's because AOC was going to challenge him in the primary. Does this change the primary dynamics for 2022 now? Oh, I, I think it's entirely too early to, to know one way or the other. Um, the entire party and the landscape of voters has shifted, and this is far more than Chuck Schumer. The book, we want to put up this book cover. Uh, perhaps we'll go down in things that don't age well. And this was uh, Andrew Cuomo's book, uh, American Crisis, about his leadership uh, during COVID-19. And this isn't the only scandals he's having to deal with and that you all have reported on, because it's not only the sexual harassment, but a lot of the real anger towards Cuomo started before this with all the nursing home deaths. Correct. Uh, the governor and his office have been accused of essentially cooking the books on the number of people who died of COVID in nursing homes, that um, he was catching a lot of criticism from the right early on in the pandemic for his policy of releasing COVID positive people who were um, hmm. recovering from the virus, releasing them from hospitals that were overcrowded back to nursing homes. Critics of Cuomo say that exacerbated the crisis. Yeah. Where, where do you see this story arc going? Because uh, he can hold on for as long as he wants, and the media has a short attention span. Uh, are there enough votes to impeach him? Is he irritated enough people and alienated enough people that they'll actually vote to impeach him? So the Speaker of New York's Assembly, the, their version of the House, came out at about 4.30 this afternoon, um, so shortly after the President of the United States spoke, and said that he had spoken to his conference, the Democrats in the State House, and told the governor that the governor has lost a majority of support. In other words, we have the votes to impeach you. And he all but said, why don't you take the easy way out? Um, mm. If the votes to impeach are there and the political will is there and they don't waste time, um, then they will present the governor with a fait accompli, which is we will impeach, convict, and remove you from office on these allegations. Or you can pull up Richard Nixon and try to save face and resign, you know, in my words. Yeah for the good of the state. Richard Nixon or Eric Greitens more recently uh, down in Missouri. That's basically what happened uh, with him. If, if Andrew Cuomo came out and said, I'm not running for re-election in what Elena sort of alluded to, would that be enough to get them to go away or would he have to resign? Is this, is this gonna end one way or the other with him leaving office? It's a very good question. Part of the Democrats calculus, and I don't wanna um, make too small the fact these are 11 very serious, disturbing allegations. This is not solely politics, but part of the calculation here has to be what would happen to the rest of the Democrats on the ballot next November with Andrew Cuomo on top. So it's possible that he may be able to offer them some sort of deal that says, I promise not to wow. run again, but would you trust Andrew Cuomo in his word at this point? You know, if his polling, Excellent. His polling recovers or something else? I mean, Excellent that's not, question. That's, they can't take that to the bank. So they've yeah. announced their intention to knock off the governor. And um, typically when you do that, you need to follow through. Yeah. If you're going to shoot the king, you better make sure you kill him. Uh, Justin yeah. Miller, excellent analysis. Great insight. Thank you. Thank you. All right. New York Attorney General Letitia Lane James said Governor Cuomo broke federal and state laws. Big statement, but he's not been charged with any crimes. Will he be? Let's bring in Robert Stock, former Nassau County Assistant Attorney, now a attorney in New York as well. Robert, uh, appreciate you being with us. You read through this 160 plus pages. Uh, if true, creepy, unprofessional, and if it happened to my sister, I'd be mad as hell. But is any of the behavior that's described on its face criminal? 
Thanks for having me, Leland. It, it, yes, it is potentially. There are allegations spelled out in Ms. James's report uh, of touching the uh, intimate parts of women, uh, unprovoked, un unwanted touching um, of the breast and the buttocks area. That in the state of New York could rise to the level of misdemeanor forcible touching, misdemeanor sexual abuse, uh, which could be prosecuted. The only issue that you would have, which wasn't spelled out that I could see inside of the report is the statute of limitations for misdemeanors oh. in New York is only two years. Uh, if these raise to the level of felony offenses, the statute of limitations would be longer and it'd be five years. But now you have on record witnesses you have corroborating evidence because remember these aren't just statements from lawyers they are these are interviews with potential victims oh. there was corroboration presented whether it be text messages emails flight manifests other people around who could corroborate the victim statements and then you have the governor in part making admissions in prior press conferences and admissions in the interview with Miss James's team although not to the forcible touching components which gives credence and credibility to to the allegations that I just don't think he can get out from underneath, whether it be on the criminal side and or the resignation impeachment side, as was outlined by your prior guests. Interestingly enough, he offered a defense of sorts. He said, I'm looking forward to a judge and jury uh, to try this case, which if we listen to your analysis might actually happen because the Albany DA uh, is now saying that he wants copies of the report to go through this. One of the things in his press conference right. today, it's not really a press conference, a statement that he made, is he played a video of him cuss, kissing and touching a number of other people and saying, well, I do this to everyone, it doesn't matter. If you were his defense attorney, would you have advised him to say that? Listen, that's theatrics. That's for the te that's for TV. Okay. That's for people who are not going to read the 168 pages that you and I read, and that many other attorneys and government officials have read. That's theatrics. No, okay, yes, everyone hugs and kisses. Everyone shakes hands. There is that type of component where he said it was cultural. But at the end of the day, if you read the report, this is unwanted sexual touching. He didn't put any photos or videos of him doing that to other individuals. So again, it's all theatrics. It's good gameplay by his attorneys. They released their own report on his website so at the end of the day his lawyers are obviously pushing back that's what they're hired to do they're former federal prosecutors they know how to play the game but again as your prior guest stated losing the support of Chuck Schumer and Kirsten Gillibrand and the president of the United States and the caucuses that support him here in New York again the walls are closing in uh, around the governor Is on there... every front possible that be the criminal front the civil front the political front I mentioned Eric Greitens in Missouri who was forced to resign uh, in because of a number of scandals, one of them involved uh, taking uh, unwanted nude photos of, of a woman. But it was thought that when he resigned, it was agreed upon, if you will, that there would be no criminal uh, prosecution. Uh, you can head off into the sunset, as it were. He's now back, but that was the agreement when he resigned. Could, is there a mechanism in New York law for Cuomo to make such a deal? It would be a back, you know, back room, you know, agreed upon deal okay. um, with Ms. James and the Albany District Attorney. But remember, I mean, the Albany District Attorney, within minutes of the press conference, put out a tweet that any victim that wishes to come to their office with an allegation and asking the Attorney General for their documents and their corroborating evidence, once that information is in the hands of a prosecuting agency and they believe a crime was committed in their jurisdiction, can move forward with a prosecution that they believe that a crime reasonably caused was committed and they have probably cause to arrest and prosecute. Real quick, uh, Letitia James is without question a political actor. She is the attorney general. Uh, one might say she would have uh, eyes perhaps on a job promotion to governor at some point in the not so uh, distant future. Can Cuomo's attorneys attack this report on the basis that it's politically motivated rather than the work of independent lawyers that she liked to talk about? Uh, yes, and I expect that they will, but they better be very careful because at that point you're now saying that this was a political hit job and you can't believe these, you know, these victims. And they're, yeah. is, is he going to sit there and, and say, you know, everyone's lying when he's already made admissions that some of it's true? So you better be very careful how you're going to phrase that type of argument and that presentation Excellent. both to the general public or in a court of law. Yeah. Incre incredible analysis. Uh, if it gets to a court of law, we're going to have a lot to talk about, Robert. Thank you. Thanks, Leland. Good to see you. Up next, switch, switch gears for a minute to the politics of COVID as cities issue new mandates 
we're still fighting over who is to blame for the recent surge in cases and hospitalizations. Plus, we're going to take a look at the political future of the Cuomo machine and deep dive into the media's love affair with the current New York governor. Is it over? Sixty-five million Americans are fully vaccinated, but about 90 million Americans are eligible for vaccines and still haven't gotten their first shot. In the last seven days alone, nearly three million Americans have gotten their first shot. That's the highest seven-day total in a month. There's President Biden doubling down on his administration's push to get Americans vaccinated. The president put a positive spin on the current state of the pandemic, but cases are rising. Major cities are taking action to clamp down yet again. Victor Davis Hansen's with us. He writes and thinks about these things at the Hoover Institution and joins us now, as they say in radio, sir, longtime listener, first time caller. We're honored to have you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. It's amazing how quickly uh, the Democrats and particularly the president and vice presidents have changed their tune on the vaccine. Uh, since last year. Yeah, I think the vaccine vaccination program, Operation Warp Speed, was weaponized from the very beginning. It was an election year. I think in that, remember that vice presidential debate with Mike Pence, Kamala Harris just said flat out she wouldn't get a vaccination that was associated with Trump. That had a lot of deleterious effects on people when you have a candidate saying it's not safe, apparently. Joe Biden inhumated the same thing. And then we had this, uh, Dr. Fauci came out and just said, we're not going to have a vaccine in 2020. It's just not going to happen, the election year. And then we had that very strange circumstances. We've never cleared it up, Leland, about the Pfizer announcement. It was scheduled for October. Uh, we were all expecting a big announcement that it was ready. And then suddenly it wasn't. And then five days after the election, then it was. And the media wasn't really involved in those uh, disclosures. They went directly to individual people who leaked them. And uh, so the idea, of, and then when Trump was president, there was a lot of media. If you go back and look at the media accounts of the vaccination, there was a lot of worry about this mRNA technology and, and it was not tried. Trump was forcing it down people too quickly. Joe Biden even said, you remember on an inauguration day, I don't know if it was just a lapse of memory or cognitive issue, but he said that there had been no bond no one vaccinated until he was inaugurated. In fact, there were 17 million people that had been vaccinated, including Joe Biden himself. So this thing was entirely fraught with a political weaponization of the issue. And then as soon as Biden became president, the media just did a 180 and said, you know what, we've got to play down the dangers and, and the possible side effects and let's get everybody vaccinated. I'm happy they did. I got vaccinated. I think everybody should get vaccinated in a cost benefit analysis. But it's been miraculous, very strange to see this, this complete flip and then people who did a lot of damage to the reputation and the ability of federal officials to convince people that it was a wise thing to get vaccinated, suddenly now blaming other people for the and fact you that even, we... You even now have the White House uh, calling the New York Times coverage of COVID uh, irresponsible uh, at times. In, in the coverage, as you rightly point out, has a lot to do with how the public views what's happening. We have a Gallup poll that we want to put up in terms of how Americans view the pandemic. 40% say the pandemic is getting better compared to 89% in June. That's a 49% drop. If you think about it in a different way, take out the media coverage and think about what we know, which is 164 million people are vaccinated and only 1,000 people with the vaccination have died seems like a pretty big success story to me. Are the American people just not hearing how good things are? Or you think they're rightly really afraid right now? No, I think they're weary. I think they feel they've been lied to. And it's not just the vaccination. They were told that the virus wasn't transmissible. And then they were told that masks were of no utility, then one mask and then two were better. Herd immunity was 60, 70, 80, or was it 90% necessary? Uh, they were told, as I said earlier, the vaccination wouldn't appear. Then they were told that if you got the vaccination, despite the side effects, then it didn't really matter. You don't worry about other people. They can, you can be in a room with people who are not vaccinated, but you are protected. So it was sort of an individual choice and everybody, and then uh, that kind of said, and then it was sold, you won't have to wear a mask. You won't have to social distance. You won't have to be locked down. 
And then that sort of tapered off with the Delta variant. And behind all of this is, is the subtext or the real truth. And that is that this vaccination is an amazing medical breakthrough. It came through very quickly in 10 months. It gives about 96% efficacy of all the uh, variants in the sense of you will not die from it and right. you'll probably not be hospitalized. And so you're absolutely right. Uh, if you count up all the number of people who have had COVID naturally, they have a natural acquired immunity, there's some overlap. And then the people who have one vaccination or two, we are getting near 70 or 75%. I think a lot of people rightly expect that this Delta variant to slow down very quickly. So we should be optimistic, we should be happy, but not when we weaponize this entire discussion for the last 15 months and people have no confidence in the CDC, they have no confidence in NIH, no confidence in WHO because of the politicalization. Yeah, we're, we're gonna get into some of the WHO uh, issues and some of the issues about trusting the media as it relates to the coronavirus a little later. Victor Davis Hanson, thank you very much from the Hoover Institution. We appreciate it, sir. Thank you for having me. All right. Up next. You know it's there. The media's unabashed love affair with the Cuomo brothers over the past year. Right now, it is forefront on everyone's mind tonight as we get new details regarding the sometimes blurry line between media and political officials. And remember, tell us what you think about this on social media, at Leland Vitter, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok. We'll see you there. I think for Senator McConnell to get up and say, we are going to confirm Kavanaugh just showed what a sham and a mockery the entire process is. There is a disrespect for women that this administration chronically uh, exemplifies. That was Governor Andrew Cuomo back in 2018. You could perhaps file that soundbite under things that don't age very well. As you might remember, the Kavanaugh allegations were decades old and broke down under even mild examination. In the case against Cuomo now, investigators focused on 11 women who went on the record accusing Governor Andrew Cuomo of sexual harassment. It's a 165 page report that we got today detailing how the governor targeted women in and out of state government. The first to step forward, former Cuomo aide Lindsey Boylan, who kissed her on the lips without warning. Allegedly, he kissed her on the lips without warning and made inappropriate comments. The report details how the governor and his team tried to discredit accusers like Charlotte Bennett, a 25-year-old former aide. She went public with her experience describing how Cuomo asked her inappropriate questions. What were you thinking as he's asking you these questions? I thought he's trying to sleep with me. The governor is trying to sleep with me. And I'm deeply uncomfortable, and I have to get out of this room as soon as possible. Cuomo's more than twice her age. New York State Assembly Democrats called an emergency meeting this afternoon to discuss the bombshell report, calling Governor Cuomo, and we're quoting here, unfit for office. The Assembly's Judiciary Committee says it's going to move forward to impeach the governor. We heard earlier that they might have the votes to do it. Remember, just a year ago, Cuomo's COVID briefings were must-see TV news. Organizations fawned over him, had interviews that had some pretty nice softballs in them. He was fawned over as America's governor, not anymore. For tonight's deep dive, we welcome in editor-in-chief of Mediaite, Aiden McLaughlin. Aiden, nice to see you. Uh, we're going to put up uh, the picture of one of the interviews that Chris Cuomo did with Andrew Cuomo during uh, COVID that you all covered extensively at Mediaite, the question would be this, are we going to see Chris Cuomo on TV in 22 minutes? You know, that's a really good question. Uh, CNN has not commented on uh, these new uh, revelations uh, for Andrew Cuomo. Uh, so I'm not entirely sure if we will actually see Chris uh, Cuomo come out and do his show. I think the bigger question for CNN is, do they allow Chris Cuomo to comment on uh, the new controversy surrounding his brother. Uh, you know, Chris Cuomo has had a conflict of interest rule uh, where he has not been allowed to cover his brother, the governor of New York, since 2013. CNN waived that rule uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, 
uh, so that Andrew Cuomo could appear on Chris Cuomo's show, which is a primetime show at 9 p.m. on CNN, uh, to do these really chummy uh, segments where they would discuss the pandemic in at times serious ways, but also in sort of brotherly ways that veered on, you know, infotainment. Um, They waived that rule and they had about 10 interviews with each other and then reimposed that rule. And since uh, Andrew Cuomo has faced scandals ranging from the nursing home scandal uh, during the pandemic uh, to this sexual harassment scandal, uh, Chris Cuomo has not covered his brother on the air. Uh, and I think it's, it's, it's sort of glaring that CNN's most watched show, their 9 p.m. primetime show, is not allowed to touch, particularly today, what is the biggest story in America. Well, um, so and, I think and that's also, it's not, he hasn't been allowed to cover his brother, but he's certainly been allowed to talk to his brother, which we know that he did uh, over a long period of time, offering advice. And in this report, we learned that Chris Cuomo was even more involved in coaching his brother uh, than we first understood. The question, I guess, going forward, forget for a second whether CNN's going to be okay with that because they already have been. Why won't Chris Cuomo's advice work a second time of just wait this out and the media has a short attention span? Uh, the, I mean, I think that that will work out for, for at least Chris Cuomo. I don't get any sense that CNN is going to be taking action against him. When uh, it was first revealed, it got reported by the Washington Post uh, in May that Chris Cuomo had been part of this advisory team uh, that was advising uh, Andrew Cuomo on how to respond to these allegations of sexual harassment. And it was even reported that Chris Cuomo was telling Andrew to call it cancel culture and to basically dismiss these allegations that these women were making. Uh, CNN did nothing. They mm. said that it was inappropriate for Chris Cuomo uh, to have advised his brother in this sort of professional capacity. And they said that he would not be doing it anymore, but they declined to take disciplinary action against yeah. uh, the 9 p.m. anchor. Um, so it's not clear that CNN really is going to be taking any any action now that uh, it has turned out that the investigation has found out that these allegations uh, are true. Um, I can't imagine this changes the equation for them aside from being uh, a little bit more uncomfortable. The original advice that Chris Cuomo was giving, in addition to saying it was cancel culture, was essentially waited out because the media has such mm-hmm. a, a short attention span. You all know that better than anybody because you cover all of us. Yeah. What comes to mind when you talk about a governor in a scandal, and history doesn't uh, repeat itself, but it often rhymes, would be the Ralph Northam scandal, which was whether yeah. or not Ralph Northam was wearing blackface. And we remember, of course, the picture that came out of Ralph Northam there uh, on his yearbook from medical school, and there was a man dressed in a Klan outfit and then another man in blackface. Uh, and at one point, he couldn't remember who, whether he was in the picture or not. Then he said he wasn't in the picture. A bunch of people called on him to resign. And after three or four days, the story just went away. Is there any reason to think the story involving Andrew Cuomo is just going to kind of go away? Well, I think we still have things to cover. I, what someone like Ralph Northam really proved with his scandal is that if you can deal with enough humiliation and just basically stick through it, the media will run out of stories to cover. You know, if there's no new updates, there's no new people calling for you to resign, there's no impeachment probe, uh, you can actually stick around as governor if you have enough support uh, from your political party. Uh, you know, Andrew Cuomo still faces a, an impeachment investigation uh, from the New York Assembly and a series of other ways that he can be held accountable. So I think the media is definitely going to be staying on this story. Um, But I I think he was definitely looking to Ralph Northam and even potentially Donald Trump before him uh, to see how other politicians have pioneered this method of basically going out, talking to the media, saying that this is this is nonsense, that you're that the allegations are false and basically trying to weather it. Uh, And it's been proven to work in the past for politicians. Um, you know, provided they have enough of a lack of shame to be able to sort of grit their teeth and get through it. Um, but I still think that we have enough uh, instances of accountability coming up that the media is going to be really staying on this. And there may be other mechanisms to remove Chris, uh, Andrew Cuomo from power short of the media basically badgering him out of town. Yeah, interesting. And we know you're going to be covering whether or not Chris Cuomo's uh, on the air tonight in uh, now 18 minutes on another channel. Uh, Mediaite.com yep. is the website. Aiden McLaughlin there with the analysis. Thank you. Thanks, Leland. Good to see you. We're going to welcome in Kelly Hyman now. She worked on both campaign trails for President Barack Obama and is the author of Build Back Better, the first 100 days of the Biden administration and beyond. Kelly, great to see you. Uh, We heard the president today, and this was definitely a distraction uh, at his news conference about, quote, uh, COVID, and even said, let's take this one step at a time. Does this distraction of a possible impeachment trial of Andrew Cuomo put the Biden agenda either at risk or does it make it harder? 
No, I don't think so at all. We have to remember really? that Biden did come out and say that he believes that Como should resign. Yeah. And as, as a woman, these actions that happen are inexcusable. Um, no one should get away with this. And he should definitely, uh, Como should resign. So, so, so to you, that's enough from the Biden administration. He should resign, didn't say there should be impeachment. You think the world moves on? No, I, I think I, as, as New Yorkers, they can, if he runs for re-election in 2022, they can vote him out. Um, they have the power to do that. Yeah, and he was elected by the people. Reasonable people, reasonable people could agree that if the Andrew Cuomo story continues all the way through uh, next November, that'd really be a distraction for Democrats, right? I don't, I don't believe so. I mean, I think we have to think of that there's five options for this. There is one that he decides, that Comey decides not to um, seek re-election in 2022, right? That he does seek re-election and he want, it wins. He decides not to seek re-election at, at, at all. He decides to seek re-election and loses or that he's impeached. And there's a lot of possibilities as that. But I believe the people of New York ultimately will make a determination of whether they want him or not to run for uh, run for office. But you know, we also have to remember about Trump. When Trump run, a lot of these women came out and we have videotape of him saying that he grabbed women and still the, the voters voted for him. So yeah. we should let it to the American people vote. And Andrew Cuomo almost said the exact same thing today is I grab everybody. And then he played this video. Uh, I don't want to use adjectives, but I think cringeworthy would probably be the, the very basic uh, adjective you could use to describe it. Uh, it included uh, Barack Obama and Joe Biden also uh, in this video of Andrew Cuomo and others basically saying eh, politicians kiss, kiss lots of people. It's not a big deal. We want to point out that this video that we're showing you was produced by the governor's office, not by us or any other media organization. Uh, was it noteworthy that you think that Bill Clinton wasn't in that video? I, you know, I can't opine upon that, of that issue of, of you know, that and um, in regards to Clinton itself. But we have to think about, ultimately, it's going to be up to the American people. Now, um, he's denied these allegations and come out and said, but as, as a woman and someone that is pro-women, I commend the woman for coming forward and speaking, and their voice should be heard. And I do believe, as, as a proud Democrat, that Como should resign from his office. Mm -hmm. I think it's inappropriate, and I think that he should resign. All right, Kelly, thank you very much. It's nice to see you. We appreciate it. Absolutely. Be safe. Stay healthy. All the best. Up next, it is considered one of the most powerful and respected newspapers in the world. But did the New York Times relationship with China impact how it reported or perhaps more importantly, didn't report on the lab leak theory? It really should be the questions of our time. Where did COVID-19 come from? Did China lie? Well, we know the answer to that. Yes, they did. But how about this question? Did organizations, news organizations, help them lie? The New York Times now faces charges of doing just that by playing down the lab leak theory and shilling for the Communist Chinese Party in Beijing. With us, Ashley Rinsberg. He has spent years researching the history of the New York Times, recently writing an article for Unheard, titled, Did the New York Times Stifle Lab Leak Debate? Note the question mark there. He's also the author of The Gray Lady, Winked, How the New York Times Misreporting Distortions and Fabrications Radically Alter History. Ashley joining us now. Uh, I noted that there was a question mark at the end of that article, a headline that you just wrote. Should there be a question mark, or to your mind, should it be an exclamation point? Uh, that's a great question, Leland. I think there, there's clearly a case to be made that something was amiss with the New York Times' coverage or lack of coverage on Lab League. For a year and a half, they actively dismissed it, discredited it. They called people names, as, such as racist, if, if anyone dared to explore it. Um, and I think all that remains of the piece of the puzzle is what was the mechanism of that relationship between the Chinese government, which was paying the New York Times money for advertising in, in the New York Times paper for a decade. So um, how did that work? What, what did that relationship look like? 
This is from the article that you wrote. At the start of the pandemic, the Times set the news and policy agenda on the lab leak hypothesis, discrediting it and anyone who explored it. The Times did so while taking money from Chinese state own propaganda outlets. Again, you have coral, you know, you have correlation. Do you have causation? That's right. Um, and we do have a clear correlation. But even that, when you're when you're an institution as important, as powerful and influential as the New York Times, yeah. you have to even avoid the appearance of impropriety. Because you're you're a news organization. People are placing their trust in you. Governments are placing trust in you. And if there's even an appearance that something is off, that should be enough to create distance. And that points to the fact that the New York Times did take Chinese money, Chinese propaganda money for 10 years. That in and of itself is enough to say something is wrong here. But when you even go further and say the Times has been pursuing long-term investments in China in the Chinese media space for the same period of time, a decade, we again have to say, things don't look right. It doesn't pass the sniff test. So actually, and that's not, where the New York Times already should. Yeah, but it's not It's go. not just the New York Times. Disney, for example, has huge interests inside of China. Uh, it's no It's no secret that the Chinese use their influence on American movie studios that are also uh, co-owned by companies that have big media interests as well. So is everybody not covering things that make the Chinese angry? You know, I'm sure there is an a organic and natural skew w across the board mm -hmm. when it comes to China. It, the influence is so pervasive across the media, as you're pointing out, Leland. But the New York Times is different because it is the New York Times, because it does play such an important role in setting the news agenda. So other editors across the media, as you probably well know, look to the New York Times for how they're going to cover a given issue, especially one as important as lab leak and the origins of the pandemic. So when they decided to make to make this to make this uh, to take this particular approach to lab leak, which is to discredit it, they sort of gave the rest of the media a nod to go ahead and do no, the even, same even thing. Even Jonathan Carl of ABC noted that uh, and proud of him for doing it, saying that we, we have egg on our face for not covering this. Uh, so far, no may a couple from The New York Times. Ashley, uh, we'll have you back on uh, when they issue one. Thank you. Thanks, Leland. All right. Happy animals to end the show when we come back. Welcome back. It is National Watermelon Day. The juicy fruit is a favorite summertime treat for so many of us, of course, at barbecues and picnics and evidently also at the zoo. This came to us from the San Antonio Zoo, where our four-legged friends love watermelons as well. Uh, in college, we used to soak watermelons in vodka. I don't think these were that variety, though. Bears here and rhinoceroses, hippopotamuses. There we go. He's going to get that watermelon eventually, sometime in the next seven seconds. There we go. Rutabay is next with Prime.